pluriform, which means that a letter can also be animated. So here it's a very simple animation, but this is not a film, but this is like a typeface. And this is a typeface in this new format where the letters are animating. The next important thing is that it's dynamic. And this means, like, for example, if I want to have a text which is like gradually uh, changing from white, from thin to black, I can just generate all the weights I need dynamically. Because there's not like fixed weights, there's just like I can just generate everything I need. So it's a dynamic uh, format. And the last thing which is important is that because of those things, a typeface can actually get the responsive. So, for example, here, it's still the same static text, so this is not like a, a film or a whatever. It's just like a text, but the text is reacting on the uh, position of the mouse. Who had ever heard about variable font formats? Okay, so half of you. A little bit less than half. Okay. But uh, whoever Challenge. used variable fonts until now? One person. One, two, two people, three. <laughs> <laughs> it's half a year old already. So that's always the big question of people. Is it like, yeah, but how can I use it and how do I apply it? And basically there's two situations. Like the first situation is uh, for online, for the web. And there, basically, you can just use it uh, straight away. You just have to cooperate with a web developer, and he will explain you how you can uh, work with it. And for example, this typeface, what you see, Zeitung, that's a, a variable font, and you can just use it straight away. Like, so you see, this is like a, a website uh, where we apply all those uh, techniques. So we had this new font format. Everybody's very hot, and we say, oh, let's do it. And then we want to use it. And then on the web, it's relatively easily but you still need a web developer or to help you. And on desktop, it gets impossible because there's no interface in InDesign or Illustrator which can handle these variable fonts. So we had this new font format, and everybody wants to use it, but basically we are stuck with support. So one option could be what we did for Zeitung is that we developed a Adobe CC extension. You install the extension, and then you get all these font features which you have in variable fonts in your desktop applications. So you get it in Illustrator or InDesign. And you can do the same thing as what you just saw on the web, that you start typing and everything goes from light to black. You can just also do it in a desktop application. So we just show it quickly. Yeah. Actually, the extension is uh, working together with InDesign, so you can make the character styles, and then uh, you can use it for your uh, document. So those, what we, this what we just showed until now was the uh, basic, which is actually here and now what you can uh, apply. But of course, there's much more, because it's this new font format was developed or defined in a way that is very, very flexible. And it's so flexible that it's even very hard to imagine, like, what does it mean? And to explain, actually, what this uh, new font format means, it's good to know, like, the all-over situation where we are in at the moment. I think the problem is that at the moment, on the one hand, as human beings, we are, like, getting a geological factor, and at the same time, we are producing stuff which hardly anybody can understand anymore. We can work with it, and it, it functions somehow, but what's really happening in the background, it's uh, quite hard to understand. And so, quite often, it's that there are the possibilities, but still, we don't know like what we can do with it. And the same applies to this uh, new font format. 
So when we looked at it and we said, like, okay, let's just try to go as extreme as possible. So what, what's the most extreme you could do with such a new font format? At the end, we came out with something like what we call the super font. And the super font is a very, very variable or very flexible uh, a font with which we can create any font we want. So, for example, here you see a little demo. Here, there's like on the right, there's all the parameters, and we predefined like certain spaces. Like when you, we select this typeface on the left, you see that the parameters are changing, and so depending on the parameters, we can simulate all the fonts which we designed until now. Yeah. So maybe the basic introduction with variable fonts, you can have a slider where your font goes from light to black. That's one slider, but you can have many more sliders. So these are many more sliders. And if you control them manually, you will immediately destroy the font. Like you will definitely ruin it. But if you use the, the presets, then you end up in a very nice location. So you end up at a, at a certain font. But it's all si still within the same font family. Is that clear? Is that, that, that's the Hopefully it's clear. But what it means, because it's so flexible, there's not only all the fonts inside this font, what we already designed in the past years, but there will be also all the fonts be included, or there are all the fonts included, which we will design in the future. And the problem with this font format is because it's so uh, like, uh, flexible and because it's so complex, like with these ordinary sliders, you cannot control it anymore because there's too many axes. So what you need to to find your way in this new font format is something what we call the super sliders. And those are sliders which are then controlling all the other sliders. And that's what we show here. So there is like those sliders which are, for example, changing the weight or the contrast or the uh, style. Those sliders or those axes are actually not included in the font file itself, but we construct them by combining all the parameters which are in, in the font file. And all this, what you see here, is like all these letters on top, they come from the same font file. It sounds a bit abstract, but it's still the same font file there. So I think, was it Massimo Vienna who said, like, you only need five fonts? <laughs> but you only need one font, and then you have everything you ever need. You're done for the rest of your life with this super font. <laughs> And if you imagine that this uh, super font is like uh, the universe and all the other universes included in this big universe, then you have to, un you have to define like perhaps uh, pseudo universes or sub universes to find your way. So what we did is we made a little application and we can just define like four corner points, which are defined by typefaces what we already created and then the super font will automatically uh, interpolate like all the other fonts which would be in between those uh, fonts what we already designed. So you see, for example, citing regular and Dolly, and then he would interpolate everything and show us like what's in between all those uh, fonts. And then he would also suggest the name, how this font could be uh, called, and what's the percentage of all the fonts inside this uh, new font. It only has all own fonts in there, but it could also have uh, Guild Sans or uh, Times New Roman or any font in there. So the big question is, of course, like, where do we go with this? Like, what do we do with this? And then if you look at other areas, like what's happening at the moment is that uh, machines are starting to... Uh, do their own things. Like, for example, we have the self-driving car, which is like already reality. And so probably there will also be the future will be the, the selfie font. And so basically the selfie font is a, a typeface or a font which talks to itself. And by talking to itself, he's again, again like modifying the way it looks like, its uh, own shape. So Fünf, 
So if you have a board, you can just switch on the selfie form. What's maybe not clear is the reactor sound, but it reacts with its own sound as well. And then because it reacts with its own sound, it changes direction and then it creates sound again. So it's an endless modification of letter shapes. So it always keeps on talking, but it always keeps telling new stories. But of course, um, it will be quite sure that all those uh, self-driving cars and self-speaking phones and uh, whatever, that there's always a, a human aspect or like a, that communication is always something between two living creatures. Real is communication. And this is the first cat we show. We, we just found out recently that the presentation will be streamed on the internet, so the internet is about cats, so we decided to include lots of cats today in this presentation. It's not for you, but it's for the people like watching online to have this internet feeling. So we have two cats communicating with each other here. Uh, that's this new typeface, uh, a new typeface what we created called Duos. And Duos is also a lot about like uh, communication, about the way people uh, communicate with each other by using uh, language. And the interesting thing is if you look at all possible ways how you could uh, re use the written language. They are always defined by these two extremes, like the semantic type and the asemic type. And basically, asemic type is writing without letters. And duos is probably like there somewhere in between. Of course, it's very readable, but there's also like a kind of a playful uh, aspect in this uh, font. So basically, this font is based around a skeleton, so it's a monoline script. And once you have a skeleton, you can do lots and lots of things with, uh, with a font. Um, it can look like anything or can be anything because you have a skeleton. So the basic family comes with four different versions, like one with a straight end here, and one with a round end, and then one with a brushed end, and then one which looks painted. And you can have many thousands of more variations if you want, but th I think this is m almost enough. Um, oh yeah, so, so people, I think now from a couple of styles. So, and for every style, there's again like different weights. So uh, there's always uh, three weights: regular and uh, mm. bold. And then this is, for example, this uh, rounded version. And then at the end, you end up with a very uh, big family. And so, if you consider that uh, every single font has more than 1,000 cliffs. There's a lot of cliffs what you have to uh, design. And so, for example, if you look this style, it's very, uh, it takes lots of time. You should do this all manually. So when we design typefaces, what we try is like to automize as much as possible. So for example, here we try to automize these uh, endings so that we don't have to draw them ourselves, that we just generate a script or write a script which is generating these uh, forms. And when you do this kind of uh, workflow, when you write these tools to generate the fonts, it's always like a work in progress. Because what looks good, for example, for one letter may look not so good in a different letter. And then you see that these problems occur. And then to make this tool better, you have to make a research actually like how a real brush functions. So the real brush looks very different than the, the, brush you, the digital brush you just saw. So you have these problems that you uh, come up with something and then you, oh, that's, you have to find a different solution. So if you have, have this stroke, and if the stroke uh, expands, then it would be logical that the brush would also expand. Or if the, 
the stroke gets more narrow, it would be logical that the uh, brush would also get more narrow. And basically, you have to find the mathematics for this and then include this in the script to have this more realistic kind of brush in this monoline script. So those are the sketches you do, and then you try to uh, convert those sketches to a, a program which is actually doing uh, what you want. So this is actually how it looks like. So that's an existing uh, font program called Robofont. And then within this Robofont, you build your own tool, which you see on the left, which is the brusher tool. And this is then uh, exactly uh, doing what you want to do. So this tool is actually uh, part of the design process of designing the font. And then sometimes people would say like, yeah, but then you can use the tool also for uh, other stuff, but I don't believe that's possible because it's, it's so much connected with the form and the idea of this typeface that it's hard to, uh, to use. Uh, it's part of the design of the typeface. It belongs to the typeface. And then you see, like, uh, depending on the parameters, you can e define exactly how the whole thing looks like, and then uh, you will also define, like, uh, a randomness, so you can make sure that the ending always uh, look uh, different. And now we can see this problem, what we had in the beginning, that if the stroke, for example, makes, like, a, a curve, that you want to have those brushes also, like, making a curve, forming a curve. So that's actually happening here, that they would meet then again, and it's a very natural uh, brush. And the nice thing is, if you have this kind of tools to make those uh, endings automatically, you can also generate lots of different versions of the font, of the same font, but just slightly different with uh, different endings. So what we can do is that we can actually deliver to every person the personal font, which looks a little bit different. So your font will look a little bit different than yours and then yours. So it's a kind of uh, personalized uh, font. Yeah, not a kind of, it is. But what you can have with handwriting itself already, and also with a handwriting font, is that things are not very clear always. Like one thing could also be something else. And then you end up with something, a kind of a communication which is could be clear or could be unclear, depends on who's reading it or inter uh, making the interpretation, it, its own interpretation, the background of the person. And this is what happens with handwriting and also with a typeface called duos. And this we include it in the font. So if you have a, a lettering, if you normally would write uh, love, it would be very clear. If you write hate, it would also be very clear, but, but with handwriting, and also with this font, you can end up with something which could be both. So it imitates a little bit or makes profit from the possibility what we have with uh, spoken language. Because sometimes you can say two things at the same time when you speak. When somebody would ask me like, uh, um, do you like the situation? I would say like, mm, yes, it's a yes and a no at the same moment. And that's the idea with this uh, uh, approach. And then if you design a font which can deal with that, of course you cannot use it in uh, uh, InDesign or Illustrator because they don't have the right tools to deal with this kind of typeface. So you also have to build your own tool which is actually providing everything required to, to use this typeface. And that's this uh, poly editor. So it's a very simple app. It's just like uh, you type something, and at the moment when the program discovers, like, oh, this is a word which could be written in this uh, polysemic way, he will give you all the options. You can just select it and make those sentences which can be read in uh, multiple ways. The nice thing is that when you, once you have this uh, sentence uh, created, you can actually just copy-paste it again in uh, InDesign or in Illustrator because it's still uh, a regular font. And if you are curious, like what's inside this font, we also have this uh, dictionary which shows you all the words. And it's quite interesting to see that there's, uh, depending on the, the, the base dictionary you're using, you end up with a poly dictionary of like 20,000 or 50,000 words, which is uh, quite a lot. And of course, you can put all of this in a variable font as well if you want. So you have all this stuff and then the polyglyphs and then try to merge it into a variable font format. 
it just works. It's just a slider which slides from love to hate. So not from light to black. It just goes from love to hate. It should be default slider fonts, the love-hate slider. <laughs> uh, one more thing, what we uh, build in uh, into the font is that communication is uh, very uh, dynamic at the moment. There is everything is in the flow, which was already predicted uh, more than 2,000 years ago. It's still true. And especially also with the uh, internet. And so uh, we have an, uh, a different app, which is called uh, the Animator. And that's very simple. Basically, the Animator allows you to make your uh, font being written, like uh, with a pen. And you can write it, for example, from left to right, as you will see now on top. Or you can also use, like, uh, to be written all at once. The good thing is that this is still text. It's not a movie you're watching, or it's not... Uh, it's dynamic. You can still copy-paste and, and, and uh, dynamically replace by annual text, or use Google Translate to translate it to Spanish, or... It's just text, which is quite useful. You, you can also make your... Uh, website, the headlines of your website, like uh, animated instead of static. And the nice thing is that you can combine also both. So if you look carefully, that you will, you will also see like the poorly words again appearing in this uh, animation. And it's very simple to uh, implement. It's basically, it's just a little uh, JavaScript plugin. And you say like, uh, this element should be uh, handwritten. And then everything will go automatically without uh, how you say, interfering with the semantics of the text. So the text is still uh, readable for screen readers and also indexable for uh, Google. You want to talk about the super font again? <laughs> the yeah. No? Oh, do it, do it. So what we uh, discover, like the last two years, is that, th that those two things, like a font and the application and the app also, those things are very much uh, related with each other. And you should not approach them uh, separately. And so the application is always very important. And at the same moment, if you do something like this, and then uh, people uh, put it on, uh, up on Twitter, uh, immediately, lots of people has, have new ideas, like how this should be done and how it should uh, look like. The interesting thing is, like here, lots of people say, like, yeah, this looks cool, but you should do it with a monospaced font. So we say, like, okay, we can uh, design a, a monospaced version of uh, Zeitung. It's again like a whole family with all the different weights, and because it's monospaced, we can also use it to uh, write our uh, code with it. And then, of course, we can use it to make a different version of the animation, what I just showed. And then if you compare those two, I'm not sure which one is better, because uh, I understand the idea that here everything stays in place, but I also like the idea on the other example that it's actually much more uh, dynamic. Yeah, this is boring. <laughs> <laughs> but what you can do is that now we have both formats, we can also try to uh, combine them. Can you actually see what it is? Yeah, you can, yeah. can, you you can read it? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Okay. So basically, this is something like a responsive ASCII with variable support, something like this. So responsive ASCII, that's very important to remember from today. It's, uh, <laughs> It's going to be the next big thing, maybe, not sure, but, but responsive ASCII. So we like the idea, so what we did is we just made the whole website also, not with variable, but with responsive uh, ASCII. So it just works, everything uh, is identical with the left, it's just in, uh, in ASCII. So this is the first responsive ASCII website we've seen. So if you change the size of the screen, the ASCII, the ASCII responds as well. So if you make your screen smaller, it will change the resolution because uh, the size of the font always uh, stays the same. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. And yeah, it's for those, uh, for the younger ones who don't know ASCII, like that's something which started in the 70s and that's like uh, when we were born. 
And so we, we, uh, we feel connected with it. And of course, like if you make research, you will find out that people used these uh, letters to make other letters or to make other forms already much earlier, like uh, for example here in this newspaper from uh, 1875. But I think only in the 70s it became really something that people used uh, very widely, also because the BBC uh, started with the teletext. And there the ASCII art was the only possibility to have like uh, illustrations. And then later in the 80s, 90s, uh, people used it in a more uh, advanced way. And of course, it's uh, very simple how the whole thing works. What you do is you have uh, the whole character set, and every letter has a certain uh, area which it covers, like a certain area of black. And this you cal can calculate. So the, here's the, the calculation of the black space of every letter. And this, if you bring it into relation with a fixed square, will uh, generate, of course, a certain grayscale. And with this, they used to generate this, uh, the ASCII. So very simple, if you have uh, the image, and you uh, bump it up, and you look at the squares, and you say, like, OK, this is uh, the grayness. You just have to find the right letters, which have the identical grayness, apply it, and then uh, you can see uh, the image. It's a cat. In the back, I think. Yeah, you can, uh, in the back you can see you can, there's a cat. The front if you don't see it, you have to uh, <laughs> close your eyes a little bit. <laughs> But of course, this is like a 20th century, a little bit uh, historical. And uh, meanwhile, we have uh, better technologies. We also have uh, better screens with higher resolutions. So what we can do is we can actually uh, make the whole thing more advanced. We can uh, divide one pixel into nine subpixels. And then we can compare this with the letters on the right. And if we on the right, change to, to like uh, the grayscale for every pixel, we will see something like this. And then you see that those do not match so well. So what we can do now is we can go back to our uh, whole character set, and you see that, the, that there's lots of letters with very different forms, but which have nearly the identical total grayness. And then based on our so-called subpixels, we can say like, okay, instead of a T, better take the L, because that's fitting much better with the uh, uh, higher resolution. And if you do it, this, or if, if you use this approach, the resolution gets nine times uh, higher of the, the ASCII art. So this is what we call uh, sub-pixel ASCII. <laughs> so for the web design, you have responsive ASCII, <laughs> but for rendering it, you have sub-pixel sub ASCII. And this uh, subpixel ASCII is also very uh, helpful if you want to use it for typographic uh, illustrations. Like, for example, uh, this it says uh, underwear. And if you want to convert this to ASCII, you will see that if you use this 20th century uh, normal ASCII, it's very uh, at the edge. It's not really very well uh, readable. But if you then use this uh, subpixel ASCII, it gets really very nicely readable. Even the contrast, the, th the difference between thick and thin is... Uh, still uh, very, very clear. So basically, <laughs> we thought like, okay, let's make this monospace version of Zeitung, uh, then we can see what we can do with this, and then you get new ideas, you start to develop all this, but the, the whole idea, once started to have uh, this uh, font uh, developed called Zeitung, to have it for very small text on screens. And uh, of that was a starting point. And of course, in the end, you will also want to apply it in print. So you're going to see what changes should be made there or how you should have to modify it. And then you come up with this monospace font, and then you start making websites with it. Um, we then thought, like, OK, if we started on the web, and then we have a font called Zeitung, which is a very old school name for a printed medium. And we wanted to ma make a loop back again to where the font started. So we wanted to return from the print back to the web typography again. So I'm not sure if you got this newspaper today. 
there's, there's still a bunch here. There's a newspaper called Zeitung <laughs> for today. Everybody gets the name Zeitung here. Um, you can still get it for free here after the lecture. And if you're watching online, you can just send a tweet now on Twitter and you will get it for free only now, <laughs> not after the lecture anymore. Um, and it's a newspaper which tells you the latest news about web typography. And people think like, oh, that's very funny to have uh, something new about web typography printed because it's outdated next week. But then you should read the whole text and then you will understand that it's a very stupid question. But it's, yeah, it's a text which you, uh, it takes 45 minutes to read. So uh, you will not manage uh, uh, in the, uh, during this talk, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah, what's always interesting is that uh, despite the fact that internet already exists for a long while and that uh, technology is very far advanced, there's still lots of space for improvement, especially in uh, typography. And that's what's uh, written in detail in the, in the newspaper. Yeah, so basically the newspaper is about if you're a graphic designer and if you're designing for the web, if you're making typography for the web, what you should keep in mind, where you have to think of what you should do and not do. And what you should consider or not consider. So it's a kind of introduction into web topography for graphic designers. It's for free. <laughs> That's again the uh, character set of uh, one of the styles of uh, Zeitung uh, Mono, which is uh, ordered in uh, grayscale. And if you look very carefully at the, our character set, you will also find this uh, one uh, character, which is uh, pronounced as uh, we. <laughs> and it's basically, it's uh, a Canadian uh, syllabics. And basically, there's the three different kinds of uh, a writing language, like uh, how we use it with the vowels, like A and N, and then you get N or with uh, syllabics, and then you have like a N or a we would be one letter, and that's what uh, this uh, one letter is about. And so in some areas in Canada, you will see those uh, street signs written in uh, three languages, so uh, English, French, and then uh, uh, carrier it's called, which uses the, the Canadian uh, syllabics. And here you see those, and here you see this combination, what I just explained, like uh, on the left there's the vowels, and then you can just combine it, and you see how you pronounce all those uh, uh, different letters. Or syllabics, I should uh, say. <laughs> yeah. And the interesting thing is that Basically, it exists already si since 1999 in the Unicode, which is already for a very long while. And our primary medium of communication is uh, the internet. And I think it's very interesting to see how those two things actually work together, the Unicode system and uh, the internet. If you look, for example, at the uh, URLs, those are still very primitive. And at the end, there's always this big hype on this like uh, very short uh, internet addresses, like uh, three letter domain, three letter dot com domain. Everybody wants to have them, and of course, everybody would like to have the single letter uh, top level domain name, for example, a dot com. But as you probably know, uh, it's not allowed. They didn't. They don't allow you to register a single letter top level domain. So a dot com, b dot com, c dot com are not existing because they say like it's not good. But at the same time, it is actually possible to register this URL, <laughs> which is this uh, we.com. And it has to do with this uh, international domain name registration system. And it perhaps also may change in the future. But the nice thing is that once you register a URL, it will always, you will, they will never take it away from you. And so we thought like, yeah, that's nice. So we registered this uh, uh, URL. And we also thought it's nice to use this uh, letter 
for the for the talk here today, just to see like how the conference uh, will deal with it. And then it's <laughs> <laughs> it works very well on the website, but somebody just showed me like an old computer which has uh, Yosemite installed, and they didn't show up the character. But if you have Shira installed, everybody should have uh, should see that. But for example, you see that on the online uh, system here on the conference, they get uh, the tofu, which means like they do not have the proper support for this uh, character, even it's like it's an official language. So now you want to visit the website, we.com, and you don't know how to get there. So you don't know how to enter this character on your keyboard. So if you want to visit we.com, like one simple trick is to go to the website of Typer Talks, and just copy it from there. It's a character, it's not a picture. And then enter it in your, uh, your, in your bar, dot com, and then you get to the website. Thank you. Whose cat was this? Whose cat was this? Sorry? Was that your cat? Sami's cat. Oh. oh. That was uh, the greetings from Sami. Well, thanks, Bas and Akim, for that uh, futuristic talk and visionary talk. You always have the most fun and entertaining new ideas, but some people may want to know what do you do with uh, variable fonts in a problem solving way, maybe, or what's the most pressing real-life application that you can think of, maybe? Like uh, this uh, InDesign extension, what we just showed, it, uh, we created it because there was a very simple uh, problem. The problem is if you want to combine two typefaces and they both have the predefined uh, weights, then probably they don't fit. So what you can do with the extension, perhaps you didn't see it, it was going very quickly, but with this uh, extension, you can just say like, okay, I take one weight which will fit exactly with the other typeface and then just generate family and he will generate a family which then fits with the, with the other form. So that's very uh, practical. Like uh, adjusting in weight or you could exactly. also probably match exactly. the X height of different typefaces. Um, I always, I saw these criticisms sometimes online uh, on Twitter or so that people think like, yeah, animation, that's cool, but do, do we really need this? Is this solving any real-life problems. Yeah, the thing is that also, because it's all flexible with this palette, and you have your whole family set up, and then you have like something in negative, you want to adjust the whole family to be a little bit uh, brighter, and that's also very simple with the ex extension. You just adjust it a little bit, say update, and then it will be like slightly uh, thicker or slightly thinner. Are you talking about this in Zeitung, in Die Zeitung? Maybe, so we will find <laughs> everyone now with a copy of Zeitung sitting yes, outside read. reading for 45 minutes. You would miss Nikolaus Netzer though, because he's up on the stage at four, so be back here at four or one of the other venues and grab one of the Zeitungs. Thanks, Bas and Akim.